Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is a deep one we're going to be diving into. Palantir has just released a new suite of products called Palantir for Government Web Services. This is an interesting one. This is going to be a little bit of a longer video because I'm going to be reading through the press release and trying to understand it as I read it and give my analysis on it. Uh, we talked about this on the Palantir Weekly a little bit, or a lot bit, to be honest. We spent like an hour on this topic, but this was an interesting one. Announcing Palantir Government Web Service, this article... Uh, was written in the Pounder blog just a couple of days ago. Uh, and it's around the technical parts of what Palantir is trying to do in the government space. I'll do another video on their other part where they talked more about like the legacy of how they've uh, uh, arch are architected the defense ecosystem, which is a very, very big deal for Palantir because it means that Palantir is essentially, you know, saying that this defense tech ecosystem, this government spending that's happening is ours to take over. This article is more about the technical elements of it. So let's read a little bit of it, try to understand it, and then we'll go deeper uh, into what the point of this product offering is and what it means for the trajectory of the business. Pounder Government Web Service, or PW, PGWS, kind of a little play on AWS, aims to make the building blocks we developed over 20 years to break into and scale our governmental business available as discrete and individual offerings. So right there, it's a modularized version of what they have sold to the government and their target, arget, target market is likely going to be uh, startups and other companies that don't have or don't or can't afford all the suite of government products that they offer, like a whole set of Gotham products, uh, but more more so other offerings in order to be able to scale and eventually sell into the government sector. Much like how hyperscalers enabled internet companies to build more quickly and less expensively, PG, PGWS will enable government tech sectors to go faster and farther by leveraging accredited, compliant, and proven technology that per, that powers Palantir platforms. Uh, this right here is very interesting, right? So AWS, GCP, Azure allowed anyone to start an internet company, uh, and then boom, you could right start scaling because you have cloud data, everything's on the cloud, you're good to go, and you can start getting to where you want to go in terms of building your business. PGWS will enable government tech innovators, so people in the defense tech space, to go faster and farther by leveraging accredited, compliant, and proven technology that powers Pounder platforms, almost as if AWS is the back end for the entire world from a cloud infrastructure, cloud computing perspective. PGWS is a much more smaller market in terms of the government sector, but obviously a very big market for Palantir, given they've worked so heavily in the government sector. Now they're modularizing all of those products in order for smaller companies to be able to take advantage of that. We want to enable our customers and partners to focus their attention on the next generation of development and innovation our nation needs by leveraging the infrastructure we have to break into our government. Our first three PGWS offerings are FedStart, Apollo, and Ontology SDKs. And this Ontology SDK stuff is incredibly interesting. We talked a lot about it last week, and we'll get deeper into it today. Okay, FedStart and Apollo, eliminating the accreditation barriers. Uh, accreditation is the ability for you to even have the correct certifications to sell to the government. So that right there is the first part Palantir wants to target. DevSecOps is a huge improvement over where the department was in 2003, but it doesn't go far enough. We built Apollo as a DevSecOps compliant platform to enable our engineers to continuously deliver and autonomously deploy modern software across many heterogeneous environments and networks. Most commercial companies need to only run in a few large geographic instances of their software in the cloud. Solutions for the department require deployment of tens of hundreds of microservices continuously across many air-gapped environments across edge and cloud nodes, networks, and assets. Apollo, again, is their flagship software to be able to uh, simultaneously deploy software across an entire organization, across an entire enterprise. It's something that Palantir built internally for themselves and then realized it was an innovative enough product to be able to offer as one of their three main offerings. Current solutions don't scale to this challenge. Apollo's autonomous DevSecOps approach separates services from environments to scale instances without scaling DevOps. Lockheed is using Apollo to modernize Aegis. Andril is evaluating Apollo on Longbow. Cisco is using it to standardize how to deliver software across commercial and government environments. Apollo makes deploying and managing your software as a service to government customers actually possible at any sort of scale without having to linearly scale high side site reliability engineers or DevOps headcount. That's really important because from my understanding of government tech or, or defense tech companies that are deploying software in the government, because you have so many different governmental agencies and so many different variations and permutations of different organizations that are allowed to see certain types of data, you need something that can simultaneously and autonomously deploy software, but also has the confidentiality and granular access controls built in place to be able to make sure that the right software is deployed in the right way. And it seems like that's what Apollo is trying to do, especially in the government sector. Uh, Apollo integrates with your existing software development infrastructure and artifact stores to make the process of deploying your software on SC2S or C2S 
air-gapped edge nodes, vehicles, and sensors easy. It automates and handles the full life cycle, including moving binaries to networks, orchestrating deployments, rollback, security, and vulnerability management. I mean, a simple example is if you deploy a piece of software, there's too many bugs, the software is not working, and you have to roll it back, right? How do you roll it back in a confidential and secure way in order to make sure it goes back to the previous version of the software without messing up uh, every part? Or, or, or user that's actually working on the software at re in real time. In addition to Apollo, we also offer FedStar, an accredited platform as a service offering, PAAS. So sort of like software as a service, this is platform as a service. Working with the department necessitates every ecosystem partner to receive accreditation for each instance of their software. Convincing sponsors to provide accreditation can take time and effort, and once partners are on board, they have to then prepare to spend 18 months and 2 million on average to complete the process, an unviable option for most sensible VC-backed companies. With FedStar, companies that can that can bring containerized offerings to our PAAS can quickly offer IL-5 SaaS and in Jan 2024, also IL-6 SaaS to their customers. That's a big deal. By January 2024, Palantir will be able to containerize your product to make it IL-6 certified, which again, Palantir is only one of three companies in the world that actually has that accreditation uh, built within them, Microsoft and Amazon are the two other companies. FedStar can turn the 18-month, roughly 2 million accreditation process into something that can be done as little as six weeks and a fraction of the cost. That right there is what we call time to value. And so if I'm a defense tech company and I need to be able to sell into the government, instead of spending 2 million bucks in 18 months to be able to try to get the job done, if you're telling me I can do it in six weeks for a reduced fraction of the cost, that is a no-brainer at all. So the first two products in Palantir Government Web Services, which again, this is a big deal. This is a whole new suite of products that Palantir is introducing are FedStart and Apollo. Now, they've always had FedStart and Apollo. Fe Apollo, for the past couple of years, FedStart, they made more popular over the summer. But they're kind of packaging it into a brand of products that they're now able to sell into the marketplace. Now, here's the part that made our head hurts, uh, our head hurt a little bit on Palantir Weekly, and I'm going to try to break this down. But this is their latest product in the suite of products for Pounter government web services, which is the ontology software developer kit or an SDK. If you're in the software world, I'm sure you've heard of SDKs before. So you can kind of put it together like, okay, so ontology as a service is what they're offering, but let's get deeper into this. The second place we can provide defense tech ecosystems an unfair advantage is with access to government data they're authorized to obtain via our ontology software development kit. One of the most challenging obstacles we face over the past 20 years has been the hard yards required to connect each source system across the department. Lacking a centralized procedure, the promise of a unified program to solve this challenge was always just around the corner but never actually materialized. As a result, we just did it by ourselves bit by bit over the past 20 years. And I'm assuming they're talking about connecting silos of data within the governmental sector, whatever governmental sector they're working in, in order to make sense of that data. Data connections. In total, we've integrated 15 or 1,150 data connection sources and nearly 24,000 sinks relevant to combat, combating commands and services, spanning warfighting, personnel, logistics, operations, intel, manning, training, and equipping systems. Our software provides more than just a data dump of rows and columns, but instead an object-oriented view of the world, the ontology, reflecting which pieces of data are valuable in their relationship to one another. Such insight is available through our highly ergonomic ontology SDK and APIs. Now, this is incredibly important. What they're saying here is you're not just getting an Excel spreadsheet of all the data we've collected over the past 20 years. What you're getting is an ontology, which is an object-oriented relationship between why this thing works with this thing and how it makes sense of this thing over here, which is what is central to making LLMs and AIP make sense, right? The whole point of AIP is that if you have an ontology, you can make sense of all your data. So the LLM, the thing about your training, the model for your enterprise to actually be useful, will know how to give answers and not hallucinations because you have an ontology of your data. The ontology is sort of the core thesis of what Palantir has innovated over the past 20 years when it came to Foundry. What they're doing is modularizing ontology as an API, as a software development kit and API, in order to leverage and essentially license it to other defense tech companies that want to be able to use it in the government space. That is what the Ontology SDK is, and it's really interesting to see how it operates. Uh, who is it for? Government programs, defense companies, and individual build builders with authorized access to relevant programs can use the Ontology SDK to enable their applications to securely search, retrieve, and enrich their associated data. This allows customers to avoid the trials and tribulations of connecting to the dozens and hundreds of source systems that make up any individual program like the Army Vantage, which Palantir got a $160 million contract from in December 2021. With just four lines of code, the defense tech ecosystem can take advantage of all the data we have curated over 20 years of data integration. And there's the code right there. So that is the uh, ontology client, their ontology SDK. You plug that into your system when you're authorized, then boom, you have access to all of that data. 
Um, and then they go a little bit more deeper into why this stuff is important and how it operates. The final thing they're talking about is called Witchcraft for operating complex software. Our next open source project is Witchcraft, the tool we used internally since 2016 to provide a zero configuration application server. It streamlines operational challenges by defaulting to the right things with regards to logging, SSL, call tracing, HTTP, R R RPC semantics, application configuration, authentication. We'll provide libraries for audit logging that simplify compliance and lower barriers as well as an online database, up a database upgrade framework that reduces developer toil and makes it practical to operate complex software in even more complicated environments as a bonus witchcraft services automatically work with an apollo and fed star this to me is more rooted around access controls and data sharing as they talk about here with authentication uh role-based access controls granular granular access controls policies etc so witchcraft which i don't fully understand but what i think i get out of it is another form or another product for how you operate within complex software environments a lot of that having to do with confidentiality and granular access controls as a byproduct of working within specific servers that are not easy to work within i mean you could talk about like you know if you're a, if you're a software company that's trying to sell a unique product to help uh, the military or the army in a certain way, and you have to have access to your data, this is what something like witchcraft would be because it's a very complex environment you're working in when you're trying to sell something to the army and you're trying to make sense of their data in a particular product that you're offering. So what it seems like is access controls and data sharing is the core thesis of what witchcraft for operating complex software will be in. Um, but it's one of those things that is not fully available yet, but it will be available with an Apollo and Fed start as soon as you get access to it. They say in the future, the capabilities described above are only the start of what we plan to provide to the defense tech ecosystem. We are committed to enabling our customers and partners where they want to, to leverage our hard-earned experiences delivering to the government so that they can focus their attention on the next generation of development. Now, look, this is really important to me for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the defense tech ecosystem is growing rapidly. Um, they put out another blog post the other day saying that uh, they, th th that, so far in 2023, we have spent all of what we spent in 2019 from the private sector to fund defense tech startups, which is about $17 billion. If that's the case, that $17 billion is going to get spent eventually on these hard, laborious processes that Poundtree had to go through over the past 20 years to get accreditation and to even get their foot in the door to be able to sell to the government by having the software necessary to do things like simultaneous deployments, i.e. Apollo, in order to manage complex work environments when you're working with the government. This idea of modularizing everything they've learned over the past 20 years and reducing the time to value, reducing the friction, being able to be IL-6 certified within the container of Palantir software in six to 10 weeks. I mean, that's that's pretty insane. And you got to ask yourself if there's $17 billion by the end of the year, probably it's going to be $30 billion spent in the defense tech ecosystem. All these private VCs that have given all this money to these startups, these startups are going to have to get accreditation at one point. That is, it, it doesn't seem like there are many competitors to Palantir in this particular space, given the 20 years of experience they have and how they basically modularize all these products in order for those companies to get access to Palantir's tool. I mean, what other company has spent 20 years, is also IL-6 certified, and has built a custom suite of products when you talk about FedStart, Apollo, and then Ontology SDKs that are highly tailored specifically to the ability to sell to the government and get accreditation for other startups and that are offering it as a service. I don't know of any that exist. And maybe that's my lack of research, but it just doesn't seem like there's that many companies that are being able to do something like that. During the podcast, we had someone comment Lunar Excursion on what they are understanding of the ontology SDKs. And they says they said, granular access controls allows only what you can see. The ontology SDK allows anyone to, be, or to have a foundry instance and build an API off an ontology. And I thought this was really insightful right here because instead of buying the entire, you know, Pouncher Foundry operating system, that which is a very thick product, if you're in the government defense tech space and you want to be able to work to sell products to the government and you're able to get the ontology SDK, which is 20 years of data all integrated within an ontology, an object-oriented explanation of the relationship of data, and then pull from that data to be able to make sense of it and further develop your product. And on top of that, you've got FedStart and Apollo that's helping you get accredited and also simultaneously deploy that software within a certain environment you're uh, operating in. This is, gets very technical, but at the end of the day, this means that they're able to do and leverage 20 years of work to any company that wants to be able to use it. And there's $34 billion of VC funding that has gone out to these companies. And that's the market Pouncher is going after. So it's kind of like, Everything they've learned over the past 20 years, they figured out how to make it into different products. Now those products are smaller, 
those products can be leveraged for maybe 500,000 to 2 million a year, whatever, maybe, maybe even less than that. Maybe it's like a hundred thousand a month, whatever it is. And these defense tech companies that have raised a crap ton of money can actually spend their money in the most meaningful way, which is getting accredited, having the controls to be able to operate in a governmental environment, and then getting their foot in the door to even be able to sell to the government. Now, a $34, $35 billion market in terms of all the spend that has happened from the private sector to defense tech ecosystem might seem like a small market, but you got to ask yourself, what is the competition in this market for Palantir, right? Like even if Palantir gets a billion or 2 billion off of that every single year, that's another billion dollars a year, another $2 billion a year. And if this keeps growing and every government or every uh, VC that starts putting more money into defense tech companies like Andrew and Palantir because they've proven to be successful and there's more money going into the system and the government, because of what's going on with China, Taiwan, Russia, Ukraine, this is where you get some geopolitical analysis here, realizes they need to spend more on defense tech software and Palantir is the backbone in order to even get your foot in the door. Just like if you wanted to start a startup today, you need a cloud computing software like AWS, GCP, or Azure. And if you don't have one of those, like you can't start a company, you can't start an internet product. Yeah, that becomes a really big deal. That becomes a phenomenal growth trajectory for their governmental business going into the future. And on top of that, you just get all these different partners that one day, hey, you like a government product? You want to try AIP? You want to try the full suite of Foundry? You want to try all of the new products that we're coming out with? Like you just have all these other clients you can upsell to that are already using your stuff and they're finding value out of that. So I think Palantir for government web services is one of those things that's going to take time to develop. I don't think we're going to see the full effects of it with really for the next couple of years, but it's setting up a suite of products that are different outside of commercial revenue and government revenue. And it's targeting a very niche group of companies that have a crap ton of money that's piling in because of all the things that are going on in our world. And they're going to need something like what Palantir is offering in order to be able to even make sense of all the money they've raised from private VCs. And it seems like Palantir government for web services is Palantir's attempt to be able to capture and ultimately take over that market. This is exciting stuff. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thanks so much for listening and watching. This was a bit more of a technical one. I'm still trying to understand this all myself, but uh, this is pretty exciting to see where Palantir's government business can ultimately go. Thanks so much for listening and watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.